Hello and welcome to the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Stephen Railston. I'm back to host today's episode. We're recording on a Friday morning, a beautiful sunny morning here in Salford. And I'm joined by Tyrone Marshall. The only negative today is we're not looking ahead to a Premier League football match because it is the international break. Uh, we're going to discuss a big Man United survey, so it should be fun. And um, that's running online on our website. So we've got plenty of questions to sink our teeth in and discuss. And as I said, I'm joined by Tyrone to do that. So first of all, Tyrone, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Stephen. I'm good. I thought you were going to say we're going to talk of the, the, the real big match of the weekend, Wrexham versus Shrewsbury at the race course. We'll, we'll talk about it beforehand rather than afterwards, because for me, I don't think the results can be <laughs> particularly good. But yeah, it's a, a beautiful day. It's great to see summer has arrived in Manchester, isn't it? I just hope we're going to get a good block of like two, three months of sunshine now that now that summer has started. It's finally arrived. Finally, after months of rain yeah, and misery. It, yeah. um, <laughs> who's going to win the Marshall Bay Derby? Rich Fear, formerly of this, of this parish. I mean, it pains me to say it, but I'd be amazed if it wasn't Faye and Wrexham, to be honest. Um, they they have had an, an annoyingly good start to League One, and we have not got our first win last weekend. But yeah, I've I've got no confidence, sadly, that we're going to be able to stop that uh, that American juggernaut um, that are making me sick to the stomach and everything that is wrong with modern football. But I do fear that they are going to beat us. I was going to get myself down Altrinum last weekend. At, at Altrinum, in, well, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've only lived in Manchester for how long? Six, seven years. <laughs> And my mate lives there as well. But it's just £25, 20 quid for a ticket, I think he said. I was like, I could just spend that in the pub instead, get a few pints, which is what we did in the end. It's crazy. Um, eh? United have played three games, Ty. Uh, they've not fared very well. It's been a disappointing start to the season. And as I've said, we've got this big Man United survey. Um, so we'll rattle through the questions. It'll be a bit of a shorter podcast today. But the first question on the survey, I guess it's the big one at the moment. Is Eric Ten Hag the right manager for United? Um, they've obviously scraped past Fulham. Joshua Xerxes with a few minutes to go, lost against Brighton and were hammered against Liverpool last weekend. Uh, 3-0 at Old Trafford. That was really poor, wasn't it? Uh, I'll give you the, the privilege of answering that one first. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice little, nice little easy one to start us in, isn't it? Who came up with these questions on this survey? <laughs> Blimey. Um it was Ty, I reckon, wasn't it? Yeah, it was me. <laughs> um, I mean, no, I don't think he is, um, being totally honest. The the evidence is is pointing strongly in that way. Um, it's just, I mean, I want to say it's very hard to say, but I don't, I don't feel like it is. And obviously, he still is the manager. He could turn things around. He clearly is a good manager, can be a good manager. But things just aren't working at, at Manchester United, and it, it kind of dates. It dates back a year now, and kind of the same issues are there, really. And you know, I, I give Tenard great credit for the first season, and he he adapted to what he had there. And after those initial two defeats, Brentford and Brighton, kind of readapted his his expectations, but also the style of play. It, it was pragmatic because of what he had. The signings, Martinez and Casemiro, played a big role got the best out of Rashford, third place, trophy, brilliant. But it was always about expanding that. And it just feels like, and I think he was unlucky last season with the injuries, but it feels like he lost his way because of the injuries with that style of play. He wanted to commit to it, but it was just, it was too adventurous for the players available. It was pressing high, defending deep, and it just doesn't feel like things have really recovered. And they, they've been better this season. Certainly the first two games, they were better but I'm still not looking at them and seeing an obvious style of play or, or anything to hang your hat on for the future. I don't really see what the plan is. I don't see how they intend, when they get the ball, I don't see how they intend to score a goal. And with the other big teams, you do. You can picture how they want to score a goal. Arna Slots had three games at Liverpool. You could picture how they wanted to score a goal and they scored some of them against United. High turnovers, quick counters, goal. They did it three times and... I just don't see with Ten Hag's United these clear patterns of play yet. And I know things changed in the summer and we're on about this game model now, but I don't know. I, I mean, things need to turn around quickly, I think, to to change to change my view. And he's, he's delivered two days that for modern supporters will, will live long in the memory, ending that six-year trophy drought and winning the FA Cup. But 
I'm just not I'm not seeing enough progress and enough not just progress but clear signs to hang your hat on to say yeah I can see the direction it's going in yeah I tweeted in June I was just searching to find it there that he was fortunate to keep his job I mean United suffered a record number of defeats in the Premier League conceded the most goals in a campaign to now go over so a total of 19 defeats in all competitions which was the most since 1978 so all the unwanted records stacked up and beyond the unwanted records it was the eye test as you've just discussed it was the actual performances themselves so there was nothing really to take from them and um, the style of play it's been absent for a long time i mean in his first year it definitely was you can't you can't deny that um it was a very solid defensive foundation that they built that season success on didn't they and they had marcus rashford paying out of his skin and obviously casemiro was was excellent as well so i suppose that helped but last season, I mean, we've, we've talked about it at length and you needed to see in the first few games a difference. He's been backed heavily financially again um, for his third summer in charge and you just needed to see more. And I think the same problems are happening again. And when supporters left the turnstiles on Sunday evening after that Liverpool game, they would have been just so frustrated thinking, it was you that coined this term, wasn't it, Ty, after the Wembley game, um, the FA Cup final, when we were praising them to, to the high heavens. You said it's the, the Grand canyon size space in the midfield. And I've yeah. actually used that in a few articles since because it is, it's a brilliant term. There's just so much space in the midfield and it is clearly a systematic problem. And even now fingers are starting to turn, maybe that's harsh to say fingers, but people are looking at Kobe Manu, wondering if he's tired, wondering if he needs a rest. There might be a little bit of truth in that. But even Manu now looking a little bit exploited in that system. And that's not on him. He's a fantastic young player, but mm. the system just isn't working. It's not getting the best out of any of the midfielders there. It's not getting the best out of Fernandez. It's definitely not no. getting the best out of Casemiro. I don't know what the best of Casemiro's got to offer these days. And it? it isn't Manu. So yeah, it's not it's not good enough. There needs to be a drastic improvement, doesn't it, in the next few weeks? Because at the end of the day, results decide um, managers' futures. And if it continues like this, it will be inevitable because when new ownerships come in, they always tend to make a change, don't they? Yeah, they do. They do. And they, they, I mean, everyone knows they wanted to make a change in the summer. I don't think it's any secret in the week leading up to the FA Cup final, they decided they were going to sack him and went as far as speaking to other managers and, and that did undermine him. And it takes a long time to rebuild that. And it, what is happening now was just so, so it was so predictable that they must have a plan for it because you know, I, I mean, I said, I remember everyone said basically Ten Hag, Ten Hag was going to be the narrative at the start of this season. However, it went. They start brilliantly. He's the narrative. They made the right decision. They start badly. Even worse, he's the narrative. Did they make the wrong decision? And they started badly. And that was that was entirely predictable, especially in a disrupted preseason with with international tournaments. But you you would like to think with the with the you know the the brain power within that football department now that they have drawn up a plan for what happens if we do start badly and obviously they're they're going to stick with him i mean i think there's an argument that if they if they do think they've made the wrong call in the summer that they, they should have made a change now to be honest but you know maybe maybe they do still have faith they're certainly saying they still have faith but yeah the, i mean the october and november international breaks are, are going to be massive i don't think there's any doubt about that and things need to turn around very very quickly because like you say everything else has changed at this club on the football front apart from the manager and he is the one that is now under pressure because he is the one now setting up for these these well i mean it's a poor performance on on sunday wasn't it and it's the, the results just aren't coming and they've got to they've got to they've got to be at least one of southampton and palace because things could unravel very very quickly maybe things will turn around but Equally, you wouldn't be surprised if if things unraveled quickly like they did at the end of Solskjaer's reign. Yeah, the next question on the survey is, do you think Ten Hag will still be in charge by the end of the season? So I suppose it kind of comes in nicely to what we were just discussing. I mean, we've got Southampton after the international break, um, obviously Barnsley in the Carabao Cup, but we'll ignore that. We'll just talk about league fixtures. Crystal Palace away. We all know what happened in that game um, at Selhurst Park last season. They got absolutely hammered. And Tottenham at home. So the next three games are tricky matches you really should be sailing past Southampton and they should be boosted by the return of Rasmus Hoyland whether or not Luke Shaw is going to be back for that game we'll have to wait and see but I think Hoyland has actually been sorely missed so it could click after the national break and let's hope it does let's hope they go on a winning run and go on a decent streak but 
will he be in charge by the end of the season? For all the reasons I've just said, I have my doubts. I presume you're the same. I Right at this very minute, I would be very surprised if he was in charge at the end of the season. It, it's clearly not impossible, but you know, if you were drawing up, if you were drawing up the odds for it, it would be odds on and quite strongly odds on that he won't survive the season. I think just because of the way things are going. I mean, they've lost sixteen of the last forty-one Premier League games dating back to to last season. It's 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 terrible, really. And I think you know a lot of people were probably trying to find it now, but the the uh, Bill Edgar, the stats guy at the Times, who who tweeted goal difference across something like the last 57 Premier League games, I think it was. And United's goal difference is, is one or minus one. And, you know, City's is something like 90 and Liverpool and Arsenal are 70 and 60. And ne- United's they never win comfortably, one. though, did they tie with, with Ten Hag? Never well, no, teams to the every, every game is an area goal difference in past 57 matches, all competitions. City plus 93, Liverpool plus 79, Arsenal plus 78, United minus one. That's 57 games in all competitions. I mean, that shows how far away they are from those three clubs. The gap is massive. Um, and for 57 games, if your goal difference is minus one, that just tells you what a slog it is. That wins, you know, wins are one in two, one in three. Defeats are, are just as regular. Even when you do win, it's not convincing. And I don't think as Manchester United manager, you can have that record for 57 games and think, I'm going to get another, what, 50 probably left in this season at the same level. It just ain't going to happen. So to to see the full season through, I think there has got to be a really, really big improvement. And you're saying um, that just shows you how far off they are to the to the leading pack. But in press conferences, in, in Tenog's presser before Liverpool, he discussed his trophy record and brought up that he was second behind Man City in his time in charge of the club. It's little things like that that I don't think... When times are tough and you're losing games, don't particularly help your your reputation with supporters. Um, so that'd be interesting moving forward. Next question on the survey: um, Can Casemiro still be an asset to United? The Turkish transfer window is obviously still open. Um, there's been suggestions that that could provide Casemiro with a, a late exit route after a really really poor start to the season. Um, I think his performance at Liverpool, we all saw it coming. I actually tweeted a few times in pre-season that the signs of decline were still there. I, I suppose there were a few encouraging performances, more in an attacking sense, actually, in the Community mm. Shield. He was actually good around the box, wasn't he? Taking playing yeah. intricate play around the box. But defensively, he was still off it. His positions, positions were still poor, um, sliding into tackles, which he never did when he was at his best, and that kind of crept into his game last season so I was of the opinion that he should have been sold in the summer that's not exactly groundbreaking I presume you're going to say exactly the same and it's just a bit of a mess now because he's one of the highest earners at the club he's going to be offended by sitting on the bench for most games but I think that's the best outcome yeah it is but you know Manchester United with the opinion he should be sold in the summer but you can't sell a player who no one wants and that is the reality of it nobody nobody wanted him the the, the expected interest from the Saudi Pro League just never materialised. And I think United knew very early in pre-season that they just weren't going to be able to offload him. So they're kind of they're kind of stuck with him. You know, he's a he's a high what is someone at United describing to me in July? A high asset player, I think, a high value player. High value, yeah. Which a high value, I think it was, which I think is more maybe in wages than than fees. Um but the reality is, if 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 the Saudi Pro League don't want to buy him, who else is going to buy him? You know, you you look at a loan to Turkey. I mean, it's a possibility. Certainly, you can understand why why someone like Galatasaray would be interested. They've just signed Osman. They've got very favourable tax rates there, which means they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have to match the three hundred and fifty or so he's on at United to pay him the same in his pocket every week. If you know what I mean, it, it'd be something more like two hundred, two fifty to match those wages. But I don't get the impression he wants to go at the moment. And from what I've been told, United certainly aren't kicking him out the door. And Ten Hag's spoken about how, you know, it's survival of the fittest and two players for every position. And and he did say before signing Ugarte, we only had one number six. And now there's an argument now you'd rather have Collier as the second one than, than Casemiro. But if Ugarte, you know, if Ugarte suffered an injury and missed 10, 15, 20 games, would you want Collier starting all of them? Possibly not. Um, you know, he's still very, very inexperienced. He's played 75 minutes of senior football in his life and he's 20. You know, he's not had a loan spell anywhere. He's very, very raw and he does look a promising player. But 
I think if 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 you're unable to offload, if they'd have sold Casemiro in the summer, I think they'd have probably signed another midfielder, but they couldn't. They knew they weren't going to be able to very early. And maybe there's an attraction to getting his wages off the books in Turkey, but I think it's pretty unlikely. And I think they're kind of stuck together now until January at the very least. And there's no doubt there can be a decent player there. You, you wouldn't want him against a team who are pressing high like Liverpool, but I'm sure he could play against Barnsley and against FC20 um, and, and come on in other league games and, and even play next to Ugarte at times. I think he'd look a better player next to Ugarte if they went down that route. There's a lot of options in midfield and, you know, we've seen enough on the ball, like you say, at times to think he can still play some kind of role, but it's also going to be a very diminished one compared to his first season. But even what you just said there, coming on and playing against Barnsley in FC20, because Casemiro, <laughs> who's won every single trophy in club football, want to do that. If I was him, if I was in his shoes, I'd be pushing for a move to Galatasaray. You can see mm. the league is a step down because, I mean, away from the top four, it's fodder, isn't it, really? The standard is quite poor. But Galatasaray have just won the league. We're in the Champions League. Um, we've actually got a decent squad. They've got a Cardi. They've just signed Oshiman as well. We mm. should provide them with even more firepower in the Champions League. Elephant in the room, United on in the Champions League. So I'd much rather go to the Gal- to Galatasaray than sit on the bench at United. Um, and I think the scrutiny as well at United, it's so intense. When you put a foot wrong, when you make a mistake, like against Liverpool, obviously two massive high-profile mistakes, to be fair, you receive so much scrutiny and criticism mm-hmm. and it's probably not that level at, at Galatasaray even though their support is fanatical and the fact they're a big club aren't they um, so yeah another interesting one to follow I think in the weeks coming with Casemiro because we wanted them to be back to his best but it's been more of the same unfortunately and uh, the next question is how worried are you about United's start to the season and there's different degrees of, of worry on this on this uh, survey tie there's very worried quite worried quite happy and very happy and I don't think anyone's going to be clicking quite happy or very happy no. um I would say quite worried I wouldn't go as far as say is very worried because um, I suppose there have been a few positive signs um, from the performances. Um, obviously, the new players coming in. You've got Lenny Euro to come back in October as well from his metatarsal injury. He looked really sharp against Rangers. And if, if any drops with Rashford, <laughs> although I've said this in the last few weeks and <laughs> the last few months probably, and he should start scoring goals. But also Hyland's back, as I mentioned in my previous answer. I think he's just so important, Hyland, to how they play. And I think they really lack his presence leading the line. So results can improve in the next few weeks when Sean and Hoyland come back and, and hopefully that happens. So I would say quite worried instead of very worried at this stage. Yeah, I would say I would say quite worried as well. I think it's a leap to say very worried. Um, like we say, that the performances generally have been better than last season. I think the midfield is not quite as open. Um, although it was exposed pretty badly against Liverpool. That, like you say, that gap still wasn't, it, that gap didn't feel like it was there. The Brighton game for the first half, even though they were losing at halftime, they were better. And you know, I've said this before. I remember saying at halftime at Brighton, in a way, the nicest thing you can say, and I did mean it as a compliment, is that it was boring the first half. And for most of last season, United were unmissable. You know, they were the must-see entertainment of the weekend for neutrals because you didn't know what you were going to get, and neither did United. And that wasn't a compliment. You know, fans were tuning in to see them lose 4-3 to Chelsea and laugh their heads off and to see them concede, score in the 97th minute and concede in the 99th at Brentford and to lose 4-0 to Palace. You just, you couldn't take your eyes off them because you didn't know what you were going to get. And I was going to say good, bad or ugly, but usually bad or ugly. Um, Whereas this season, the Fulham game, most of the, certainly the first probably hour of the Brighton game, were just more, they were a lot more prosaic and dull. And that was certainly a step forward. Kind of went back a bit last week, but you know, I, I do think Liverpool were really good last week. To be fair to them, um, uh, and yeah, I, I, I would go with quite worried. Like you say, having Shaw back will help, but I think that's more likely to be closer to the October break than September. I think he might be back in training, but you know, he's got a lot of match fitness to build up, and I don't think United are going to risk him. My biggest concern remains. Even maybe even more than the manager, the goals. I just really don't see where the goals are coming from. And this is a team who struggled to score last season and have got rid of a midfielder who contributed 10 goals. And most of them were really important goals. And I don't see another midfielder who's going to pick up the slack there. I don't see Mount getting 10 goals for all that he he does positively. He doesn't look like scoring. And, you know, the, the strikers, I just don't. 
I don't really get the strategy over the last two years with with the strikers. And I know you're saying Hollington's an important player. There were, there was flashes last year where he looked brilliant. The first 13, well, the only 13 minutes he played in pre-season, he did look sharp. The last game he played in the Euros, he looked so, so raw um, against Germany. You know, he, he he missed a couple of chances there that night. His link-up play was all over the place at times. And I, I think that's to be expected when he's not that experienced. And, you know, this it isn't really a criticism. And for any fans who, who are getting annoyed about it, senior people at United said when they signed him, he's raw, he's... He, he's you know, he's, he's a diamond who needs polishing. He needs work and good coaching. And I think we have seen improvements when he's been at United. But we said, we said, I remember the day he signed on tour in San Diego and we were talking about it. The, the rest, you know, quite a few of us, the pack over there. And we said, how many goals are you going to get? And I remember saying, if he gets 15, that is probably a good, a mental league goal to be fair, but 15 is a good season for him. And he got 16. And I think it was a decent, good season for him. But United aren't going to achieve what they want with a striker who scores 16 goals. They need someone who can get 25 in all competitions at least this season because they haven't got anyone else who's really prolific. Garnaccio is not yet prolific. Rashford has, has stopped being prolific. Ahmad doesn't look like he's going to be prolific. You're not, you've not got a Salah-esque player who's going to provide the goals from out wide. So you need your strikers to score. And I just think both of them are of a very similar profile in Hoyland and Xerxes in that this is a major step up in their career. They've both got a lot of potential, but they're both kind of still learning and developing. And, you know, if, if, I'm, and if that's, I've got that's a concern, the club's that's fault, though, isn't it, Ty? I mean, they've spent yeah. over 100 million on these two players who had very average records in Syria. I think they both arrived on the back of scoring 11 or 12 goals in, in Italy, yeah, yeah. which yeah. doesn't, do you know what I mean? So it's probably just par for the course how they're performing. United should have expected it. And you could have argued, well, why haven't they came in and signed Ivan Tony? For less of the that fee, or I don't know, Victor Osherman, who was at the height of his reputation last yeah. summer, he's now obviously went to Galatasaray. But you could have signed someone else for how much money they've splashed out on those two forwards. Yeah, you could, and one or both of them might come good in two, three years down the line. They might both be twenty goals. I think Hoyland will. Players. Yeah, Hoyland's definitely. Yeah, I, I think Hoyland's definitely. Good. Yeah, I mean, it's still early days with Xerxes, um, and he's, he seems to get in the right position for chances. But you know, it, like I say. They, they might even if one of them is a twenty-five goal a season, thirty goal a season striker in two, three years, that's good. But what are you going to do in those two, three years? Because I don't think United are signing players now to win the league. Well, I mean they're not going to win the league this season, are they? But that shouldn't be the aim because in two or three years, there's probably another area of the team that needs looking at. And are you going to sign another player who's not there yet but might be? You know, it's this is Manchester United. They should be looking at having a team and a player ready to win now, not in a few years. And you just did the I cliche just, there, though. This is Manchester United. This, I know, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did do You're that. right, though. It's kicking, it's kicking the can down the road, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah. I just think that they signed... And I know, I'm no issue with the Hoyland signing. I think he's clearly a player of great potential. I just think this season, it might have made more sense to get someone a bit more experienced to, to back him up. And I think, you know, you look at Xerxes for 36 and a half million and Tony for 40. If they're... If, if, I mean, I, it's impossible to know now, but Tony, for me... 75, 80, 95, 85% would score more goals in the Premier League than Xerxes if he'd been at United this season. And, you know, to be fair to United, when, when they signed Xerxes, Brentford was still holding out for an excess of 50 million. They weren't to know that there'd be no takers and the price would come down. But I just feel like given the given the profile of Hoyland, it would have made sense to get a slightly different profile of striker, one who's experienced in the Premier League, who's had 20 goal, 20 goal seasons previously, rather than someone who's got a very, very similar record and profile to him and is still kind of learning their trade. The only question mark I've had with Tony is his personality and character, actually. And I could be completely wide of the mark because I don't know him. And he was included in the England camp and Gareth Southgate seemed to like him, which is a decent enough recommendation. But there's a, I don't know if you remember the clip when he was out I think, in Dubai and he's saying F Brentford mm -hmm. and he was suspended for that. And there was another case, you kind of called him a small club when he was in a car. And to disrespect your own club like that, is a bit poor um so the question marks around his character for me with tony but no doubt he's an excellent player but he's in saudi arabia right now and he's ended yes, career yeah. essentially at 27 years old 28 years old which is yeah, yeah. an interesting choice um next question on the survey is what should united's ambitions be for this season again it's a multiple choice there's title challenge top four any european place and win a trophy 
is an option. I think we'll both agree again. I'll say top four. It was always going to be the aim this season. Get back on track. Get back into the Champions League. Hopefully win a trophy as well. Um, three trophies in three years would be fantastic. But when you look at the teams ahead of United, Manchester City, Liverpool and Arsenal, it really it almost feels like they're form their own little mini league at the top of the league now, such as their quality. And I mean, mm. you saw that on Sunday afternoon when Liverpool were ramp ramping at Old Trafford, despite losing Jurgen Klopp and bringing in a new manager. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought Liverpool might drop off this season, but it looks like they won't, you know, arguably they're even better. Um, certainly that performance at Old Trafford was was better than the ones Klopp's teams delivered at the end of last season in, in terms of the control of them. So the top three looks sewn up. So... It's, you know, the ambition has got to be top four. That doesn't mean the ambition isn't to win a trophy. Of course, you're going to try and win a trophy. But, you know, uh, I mean, you can't have escaped the Solskjaer Ten Hag comparisons this week. And it's it's Camp Solskjaer for me. It's got to be top four and a trophy you, is you, a bonus. You Camp Solskjaer on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably yeah. half and half, you know. Cause... Yeah, well, I think fundamentally they're both right and they're both wrong. Because yeah. they were both speaking about, you know, Solskjaer got his team to countless semi-finals and couldn't get them over the line. But his league record is better than Ten Hag's, incredibly. You know, he averaged 1.8 points a game, Ten Hag's 1.74. So, you know, obviously, Solskjaer's are going to say it's about the league, whereas Ten Hag's won two cups. I don't know if you've heard that they've won as many, you know, only Man City have won more trophies. But um, so obviously, he's going to point to the trophies. So they're serving their own agenda. And, you know, they're, they're both right, really. United should be making progress in the league and should be winning trophies. So they're both right and both wrong. And in a way, it probably shows why they're both wrong for Manchester United. Um, but the league, you know, Solskjaer is right in that the league is a clear judge of progress rather than a cup. A cup is knockout football. You can get a lucky draw, which United didn't in the FA Cup, to be fair. You know, beating Liverpool and Manchester City to win the FA Cup is a, a phenomenal achievement that they had a kind of draw when they won the Carabao Cup the year before, but you've got to take advantage of it still. Um, but I just think the league is, is clearly the gauge of progress. It's a 38 game season. It's, it's clearly where you judge where you are, and United are eighth. And, you know, Tenar keeps saying, oh, we've only Man City have won more trophies than us. So, does he believe that only Man City are better than Manchester United? I bet he doesn't. And if he does, then alarm bells would be going off in my head because they're clearly not. There's clearly a lot more teams. Just because Liverpool and Arsenal haven't won as many trophies doesn't mean United are better than them. And I know winning trophies are brilliant and are memorable, but the, the league is a judge of progress. And I also. You know, you mentioned this before, he's got to stop mentioning it in press conferences. He really has. He needs to be told to, to stop. I mean, every single, pre, what are we on now, six press conferences? I think in every single one now, he's mentioned the trophies. It's getting like that Faulty Towers sketch, don't mention the war. And, you know, he, he needs to be told when you go into a press conference, don't mention the trophies. And I can see him coming out saying, I mentioned the trophies once, but I think I got away with it. It's, you know, it's 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 a brilliant achievement and he's always going to have it. And we were there. We either saw it on TV or we were there. We know it happened. But it's when you've just been beaten 3-0 by Liverpool, kind of irrelevant. It's happened. It's been and gone. Brilliant day. But this is about the future now. And how do you build that future? And you just can't keep harking back to them. Everyone knows about the trophies. Everyone knows you've won a lot of trophies with Ajax. Fantastic, you know. Brilliant. And you've delivered, like I say, two great days for, for the modern United. But just stop mentioning them because we know. And it doesn't it doesn't really mean anything at the moment when you keep mentioning it because, you know, unless you're saying that you think United are the second best team behind Manchester City, then it's it's pointless to stop, to keep pointing to it, I think. And the progress has got to be judged in the league and it's got to be top four. And I think, I think Ineos desperately need top four to make their business plan work. And, you know, United had a, had a habit early on of sacking managers and getting rid of managers when the Champions League was was a mathematical impossibility. I don't think they'll wait that long this time. I think if we reach October and November and they're still well adrift at the top four, I think Ineos will feel they have to roll the dice, to be honest, because I think they know that top four is imperative, not just for this football club, but for their their financial model as well. There's a lot of Solskjaer revisionism flying around on social media at the moment, but there's been a quote from Ashley Young that's popped up as well. I assume you've seen it where he discusses when Solskjaer come in, it was like having the, the boss, Alex Ferguson, back. And he says he was talking about Man United and not what he, a manager had achieved at a previous club. And it's kind of a reference almost to Ten Hag now, isn't it? When he talks about that yeah, success yeah. he's had at Ajax and, and he keeps harping back to those trophy wins. To be fair, I think Solskjaer deserves some revisionism because his tenure is just mild 
arguably with the exception of probably with the exception of Mourinho, but it's miles better than anyone else's in terms of kind of the consistency and the results he got sacked for. Ten Hag has been delivering for over a year now. You know, it, it unravelled very quickly for Solskjaer, but he was sacked on the back of, I think it was something like five defeats in 12. I can't exactly remember. And obviously there were some heavy ones there. Yeah, it was the manner of There were some heavy, wasn't yeah. But I mean, is that any different to some of those defeats United had last season or on Saturday or on Sunday rather? Not really. You know, but Ten Hag has just benefit from those who have come before, hasn't he? Because, I mean, it's almost the case. If you keep backing horses, you're almost backing the wrong one at one point, just out of stubbornness. I mean, there's been this cycle of second managers and fans have been so sick of it and they've went, right, we're going to stick with Ten Hag no matter what. Mm. And it's admirable, but also it's kind of got United to where they are now because we all saw what was happening last season. We all thought the decision was wrong to keep him in the summer. And I guess bearing the fruit that we expected um, in this campaign. We'll we'll have to crack on, Ty, because our podcast producer is leaving soon. Um, how happy were you with the transfer window is the next question. Very happy content, not happy at all. Um, obviously signed five players and made excellent um, headway with outgoings, I would say, actually. I thought they were very proactive in the market this summer. And an impressive aspect of that as well, including high sell-on fees and different kind of clauses that we've seen Manchester City do a lot in the last 10 years. And that's helped them, especially in the area, uh, in the era of PSR, um, getting some money back off the future success of their players. So how would you rate the transfer window? I thought it was quite impressive, but with transfer windows, you always have to wait a few months, a season, two seasons to fully judge them, don't you? Yeah, you have to judge it down the line. But looking at it now, I'd say... I'd probably say somewhere between content and very happy, but if we have to choose from the two, certainly more more towards very happy than content. I think it was a really good window. They they sold very well, which is, has been the major weakness in recent years. They signed well. They got players for pretty good fees. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest successes for me in the window is the player that didn't sign in Brantway, because that sends out a message that we are going to be different to what's come before. And I said at the time, you can Everton will be holding out for 75 million because they'll say, well, you said you weren't going to spend 80 million on Maguire and you did in a lump sum. You said you wouldn't go above 60 million euros for Anthony and you went to 100 million euros. You said you wouldn't go above 60 million for Hoyland and you committed 64 plus 8 million in add-ons. So, you know, we've, we've been here, we've done that before, so we can do this dance if you want. But the evidence suggests that eventually you will just give us 75 million and they didn't. They walked away and they signed De Ligt instead and they didn't go back for him. And... You know, I think long term, that probably sends a message to clubs now that right that that United, you know, people at United always talk about a United tax. You that is your fault. You have encouraged that United tax because you have acted shoddily in the transfer market. And I don't doubt there's a certain degree where people up the price, but they were up in the price and taking the mick because you were a soft touch, and that has changed. And I think with Branthwaite, they proved that had changed. And you know, it might be the deal that they didn't do is actually the most fruitful one in terms of them saving money going forward because it kind of changes the narrative and shows that they're not going to be a pushover anymore. Yeah, I've said on previous podcasts that it takes time to change your reputation in the transfer market. And I think if there's a few examples of that where they show, look, we'll walk away, we'll happily walk away, then that will change and it will get better fees Mm -hmm. for their players. Um, What else do United need to strengthen is the next question. There's every position listed, so I'm not going to go through them. I'd say left back, um, Luke Shaw, He's getting on now. He's actually been his longest serving player at the club, surprisingly, when you when you think about it. 2014, wasn't it, that he joined from Southampton? Mm. But, I mean, Tyro Molassi has been missing in action. You've got Harry Amas progressing, but I'd still like to see another left-back. Um, where would you like to see strengthened? Um, I would say left-back. I think left-back's got to be the obvious one. Um, just because of the injuries. You know, we, I mean, Molassi has not played for well over a year now. No one knows what, what he's going to be like. Shaw sure, just can't stay fit and that is becoming a major problem so I think left back is is the obvious one and I mean maybe the next one would be wing maybe right wing um you know Anthony just looks a busted flush now he can't get he can't get a kick um hard to see how he forces his way back into that team I like Ahmad a lot but is he ever going to be kind of a title winning winger at this team do you need more um so I do wonder if now Sancho's gone Anthony surely has to go next summer so I can see a scenario. There's going to be questions about Rashford next summer if he underperforms again. So I can see a scenario in the summer where you want to get another starting winger in to, to complement Garnacho that is at that, I won't say world-class, because obviously Tenag 
took that very badly in the, the press conference. I suggested that Garnacho might reach world class level, um, but someone who is you know of that standard, who is up there and has got either is world class or has got the standard to go to world class. Because I think I do think there's questions over a couple of those wingers at least at the moment. I was going to do a Tenag impression there, but I think he's actually very hard to do. It's his little he Dutch grunt yeah, that he yeah. does. His mannerisms are very hard to replicate. Yeah. Even my friend who's good at those, he just can't do it. Um, what have you made of any since taking control of the club? Delighted, pleased, jury's out, disappointed. I think pleased would probably be the, the fairest assessment. I mean, they've been proactive with, with Old Trafford plans. They've had a really good transfer window. Ratcliffe's got a, a good operation in place now. He's got a good football structure in place still finalising it, still appointments coming in, even yesterday with, or on Monday with Sam Erith starting on Monday. Um, so I think th you can't get away from the redundancies and I think that stops it being at the, the very, the very, very top level. And, you know, the, the redundancies, whether they're needed or not, it's not a good look. Um, personally, you, you could argue they employed too many staff, but when you look at the savings and what it would fund in terms of the play inside, it's just mini school, to be honest. And, maybe it was needed and if he's going to do it now's the right time because if Ineos had tried that there would have been there would have been hell to pay really um so that's the kind of thing that Ratcliffe can get away with very early on in his tenure but you know I, I was speaking to a long-term staffer there on at the weekend and they said morale you know morale is pretty low because of it because people who've been here for a long time are losing their jobs and you've got to remember it's for the vast majority slash all of them that is the job of a lifetime. It is the dream job to work for Manchester United and now it's gone and it's taken away for them. And, you know, perhaps there is business sense to it, but I think it's very hard to stomach when you're looking at players who essentially aren't earning their salary and are not banging the drum for players being paid too much. You know, it's better that money ends up in players than pockets than, than some other areas of football. And that's just, just the way it goes. And they are the, the star attractions, but... When they're under, really underperforming like that and 250 odd people are losing the job of a lifetime who might be on 30, 40, 50 grand a year, you know, I think it, I think that's hard to stomach and you can understand why morale is pretty low. And whether it was needed or not, you know, even if it was needed, I think that still stops you saying it's they've been perfect because I, I just don't think you can do when, when there's been that, that amount of job losses. Yeah, I'd echo everything you've said. We obviously talk to people who work at the club at different departments and just a lot of good people have lost their jobs. It's a shame to see. It kind of does leave a sour taste in the mouth. But I think the reality is, and this is unfortunate, and those people have realised this, if United are winning on the pitch and they're winning games, fans aren't really going to cause an uproar about this. Um, I actually did a piece on it, trying to cover it and shine some light on what was happening. And one fan was disagreeing and saying, oh, no, it's... A, it's the good cuts and that should be happening and stuff. I mean, it is more nuanced than that, but I think it's bottom line. It's a shame to see a lot of working class people as well lose their jobs in the area. Mm. It's a big shame. Uh, the next yeah. question is what should happen with Old Trafford and um, renovate or build a new stadium? I've actually changed my mind in the last six months or so. I was always renovate for the history purposes and to keep that feel of the stadium and what's been happening there in the last 150 years or so longer than that. Um, but yeah, I've, I've so I've changed tack now, Ty, and build a new stadium. I presume you are too. Yeah, definitely build a new stadium. I mean, it's on the same site, isn't it? It could still be called Old Trafford, albeit if they build a new stadium, they've already said they're going to get a, a sponsorship for it, naming rights for it, but it'll just become Emirates Old Trafford or something like that, like the cricket ground is. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, building a new Snapdragon stadium Old is... Snapdragon Old Trafford. Snapdragon Old Trafford. I mean, it's, it, the only issue with that is it's probably going to take 10 years and maybe Snapdragon will have moved on by then. <laughs> Um, but I can they, they will certainly be very interested at the moment because it's clearly a very healthy relationship there. So, and I don't think United will struggle to get a naming partner for it. But yeah, it's got to be it's got to be building a new stadium for me. And whether you turn Old Trafford into a fifteen twenty thousand seater academy stadium, there's a lot of land there. It might be a possibility, but it's got to be building a new stadium. The, the only question is how do you finance that? That I think that you know, Ineos and Ratcliffe clearly want to build a new stadium. The issue is going to be how do you get the money together for it because it is going to cost a lot of money. And what's the best bit about a new stadium, a potential new stadium, Ty? It's not the increased capacity, um, new concourses, fantastic fan experience. Hopefully, it's going to be a state-of-the-art mix on. That's what new... everyone cares about, isn't it? Well, yeah. I, actually, I was going to say a press box with some room in it. Um, <laughs> well, that, yeah, we'll take so, both. So, you know, I, I did say on the, the, the... There was two from The Guardian there on, um, on Sunday, and David Heitner was there. He sits next to me. Sometimes The Guardian only bring one. 
and it means I can I've got two seats to myself and I can stretch out and put my coffee on that one and my phone on that one. But sadly, there was four of us crammed into a row, and I was sat next to, to David Heitner and was saying, oh, "I can't I can't wait until they have a new stadium and we can get a press box where we can actually move." So, um, that would be so that that would you be the keep highlight each other for warm, me. Though. Me and, me and Jonathan Wilson were nestled into each other and we were laughing about that, both in the northeast. So, uh, yeah, we were keeping each other warm and it comes in handy in the, in the winter months. Uh, we'll leave it there, Ty. That was the end of the survey. Our producer's off. Uh, he's, a busy, he's a busy man, I think, from what he's said. So, uh, thank yeah, you very much yeah. for your time and I hope you have a good weekend. Thank you, Stephen. I intend to. You too. I'm off to Haydock tomorrow, off to the horse racing. Sure, I, so I certainly will. I certainly will. Uh, enjoy your weekend, to the listeners. Hope it's okay about the football. We'll be back on Monday, I presume, for another podcast. Take care.